Okay, I think we're gonna get started. We still have some people signing in, um, but they'll just miss this um, introduction. Thanks for joining us today for today's webinar on Spotted Lanternfly. I'm Rachel McCarthy and I work on the FIRST Detector Program and I'm with Cornell University. Uh, before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and um, we will post the link on the FIRST Detector training site after the webinar is over. Uh, we hope that you'll revisit the content yourself and that you'll share the link with friends and family uh, to help spread the word about the importance of early detection as it relates to plant health. We also invite your comments and questions. Um, you'll find a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for our speaker, just type it in the Q&A box and we will hold it for the discussion portion of the program uh, at the end of the lecture. If you have any technical issues uh, with your sound or with your video, um, you can use the chat box for that. So today's presentation is by Eric Day. Um, Eric is an entomologist and diagnostician at Virginia Tech. Um, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Eric, who's gonna um, tell you a little bit more about himself before he gets started. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, talking about an insect that um, has kind of taken over my life as well as other entomologists in the, in the area. So uh, I am an, uh, run the Insect Identification Lab at Virginia Tech um, and I'm also a survey entomologist. So I have been um, looking for insects and receiving insects and doing diagnostician work since 1986 here at Virginia Tech. Um, spotted lanternfly was first detected in 2018 in, in Virginia, but was detected earlier in Pennsylvania. I'll kind of get into that later on. Uh, I know we have some time for questions at the end, but also too, um, uh, if any kind of questions about this later on, feel free to reach out to me, send me an email. I'll be happy to share whatever I can with you on that. So let me go ahead and launch the slides here. And that should be good. So. Uh, this uh, topic of my talk is spotted lanternfly, and we'll go ahead and launch into the slides here. So spotted lanternflies can be found on over 70 different host plants. They prefer tree of heaven, Alanthus altissima. Uh, tree of heaven grows commonly on disturbed soils and thus is often found on transportation corridors such as rail and along highways, also found commonly at factories, warehouses, next to rail lines, rest stops, and truck stops. So we've got an invasive insect that is showing up on an invasive plant. So scientific name for a spotted lanternfly is Lycorma de la Catula. Um, it's a fulgoridae uh, in the plant family fulgoridae, so one of the fulgorid plant hoppers. They're also known this group is known as lanternflies, and mostly they're tropical. And if you Google lanternflies, you'll see there are a lot of very colorful species out there in this group. Uh, it is one of only two lanternflies we have in Virginia. There's another one that is um, quite a bit, uh, not nearly as colorful, uh, that is, is native. Some of the family characteristics of Fulgority um, are reticulate venation of the hind wings, sometimes the forewings. You can definitely see that reticulate venation there on this particular specimen. Uh, wings are held in a tactiform a manner, tent-like manner. Um, some of the elongate head process, not like Cormodella catula, but other species in the Fulgority can often have a very large projection on the top of their head. Second tarsomere of the hind leg, bears a row of teeth. Um, some other plant hopper families do share this particular trait. Top picture there is a cluster of nymphs um, on a stem of a stump sprout, Alanthus. The picture below is a spotted lanternfly on bark uh, in, in Virginia. Okay, this is information from Lawrence Berenger, uh, and this is some information on the, as, uh, also from um, Surendra Dara on the sizes of it. So they, they of course vary in size as they're going through development. Uh, so they start out um, a little over three and a half millimeters long. Uh, first instar, second instar about five millimeters. Third instar about seven millimeters. Um, fourth instar about 10 millimeters. The fourth instar has the, this, this red pattern. The first through third will be black with white spots. The number of spots can be variable. 
but the projection on the front of the head is, is going to be pretty visible throughout. Right now, we have just as of yesterday, have found fourth instar uh, nymphs in Virginia. All right. So the confirmed locations, and this is kind of a moving target, uh, they are increasing in numbers, um, number of sites, unfortunately. Uh, and you can see that based on this map produced by IP, New York IPM, that the, uh, and I'm sorry about the lawnmower in the background, um, that there's an additional number of counties um, in Pennsylvania. And you look down to Virginia, you can see the red outline county is the county of Frederick, which includes the city of Winchester. Uh, to the east is Clark County, which is not under quarantine, but has had its detection. And just north of Virginia, in West Virginia, is Berkeley County, which has had a detection there for this species. Uh, that picture right on the right um, of them in a row, which they didn't last very long in that situation, that's on bittersweet. Um, and so we are constantly picking up new host records for this particular insect. And before I kind of talk a little more about the Virginia distribution, I would like to mention too the input we've had from citizen science volunteer detectors. This has been a project we've been working on the past couple of years, a little bit um, stalled right now due to COVID, um, although we will be picking it up um, on the 22nd of July, getting it going again. So this is a demonstration we're doing, in this case in Warren County, which has not been found in, uh, and so demonstrating it as well there on the right, you can see the app that we have. It's this app on ArcGIS Survey123, and people can just pull it up on their smartphones. Um, smartphone automatically captures the map data, and then they can enter the information where they found the spotted lanternfly or not. So from that, we develop a map that looks like this. So this is a little bit more of what we're seeing in Virginia. Now, before you get too alarmed, uh, the black is negative. So the black dots indicate it was not found. The purple spots are places where it has been found. And we zero in a little bit more on that. And this, you'll see the purple spots are clustered around the city of Winchester, Virginia, um, and then kind of scattered about a bit on the eastern and southern parts of Frederick County. And they are those dots that appear to be in Clark County are in fact in Clark County. So that's the Clark County infestation right now at this time is very small. So this has all been inputted by the citizen science detectors. Um, they can verify things with a photograph or send in images into the portal. So I think it's worked really well for a relatively small infestation like we're seeing in Virginia right now. Um, maybe down the road, we'll have to kind of scale back on this kind of a project. So spotted lanternfly. So where is it going to be? Um, the, the potential distribution as developed by the um, ARS, USDA, uh, is closely aligned with the potential with the distribution of Alanthus altissima or Tree of Heaven. And so you can see the areas in orange, red are going to be high um, potential for spotted lanternfly to move in. And so I think it's kind of coming soon, unfortunately, to a location near you. Uh, so that this is something kind of everybody needs to be out, out on the lookout for and keeping an eye out for it. All right, uh, we've been, okay, another sort of key thing here or repeating kind of thing is that we are learning as we go. Uh, every year, um, every month, um, it just seems sometimes like every day, pick up new information on hosts, life cycle, and this sort of thing. Right now, we have seen just one generation per year in Virginia. Uh, we have seen no indication of two generations per year. Uh, and so they typically, uh, egg hatch is going to be occurring sometime in late April, um, from in May and June, you have the development of the immature stages, July, you have the adults emerging and the adults have been laying eggs in September. So that's just kind of your basic life cycle. I'll get a little more detail here coming up. So this would be first egg hatch. And so these are what are poking out of the eggs here are the neonates. They don't, haven't developed their full coloration yet, uh, but you can see their eye spots. Uh, and so you can also see that the opening they made from the egg, egg is kind of a slit-like or elongate oval type of a 
emergence, which will be different, say, if it was parasitized, um, we're always looking out for that. We haven't found it yet, but a parasite, parasite would emerge with a round exit hole. So first hatch, um, 2018 was May 9th, uh, 2019 was April 27th, uh, 2020 was April 22nd. About 200 degree days is what we're finding, and that's backed up by USDA research and modeling on this particular insect. So what does it look like from late April to the middle of June? It's gonna be in this black stage with white spots uh, and slowly developing. Uh, and so all these, this particular first through third instar stages are all less than one half inch long. Uh, and so they have this projection on the head, um, which is very distinctive. Um, and there really is not much else in the environment that, that you would confuse it with. There are a few things that get close, but they're a very distinctive group. And also uh, we've been relying on reference material, but identification on this particular insect is pretty easy. Another characteristic, not really taxonomic, is that they readily hop or jump away. And collecting them, getting a picture of them, doing anything, it involves you being fairly quick um, because they tend to hop and move away very quickly as you approach. All right, so starting in late June, um, early July, we get the fourth instar. And the fourth instar, uh, it's still wingless, uh, but has the red coloration, still black with some white spots on it. It's still the same projection on the head. Uh, it, again, very quickly jump or hop away when you encounter them. The one in the middle is not hopping very far because it's caught on a sticky band um, that one of the monitoring tools for the particular insect. All right, where to find them? Everywhere. I think the thing, and I don't mean to sound, make too much light of it, but it's, it's either on Tree of Heaven or the tree next to it, um, or the plant next to it. Uh, so if you locate Tree of Heaven in the landscape, and unfortunately it's very common in Northern Virginia, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the second slide, uh, but then you just look on anything nearby like poison ivy, stump sprouts, um, walnuts, uh, cherry, Virginia creeper, um, bittersweet, they just pointed out, but just a very wide range of host plants. And even though it's a very conspicuous coloration because they tend to move the other side of the stem or hop away, it's not exactly easy to come across them when you're out in the environment. It takes a little bit of training, kind of a little bit of uh, getting used to them out when you're looking around for them. All right, this is just kind of a, considered as a partial list of pests here. And they're kind of in two categories here. The ones with the E next to it were ones where oatheca or the egg masses were found. The other ones, um, maybe we just say the egg masses haven't been found yet. They do tend to be kind of transient. You will see them on some hosts, but we don't necessarily catch them feeding. Uh, but but it's kind of, so it's again, it's sort of, again this learning curve that we develop from this thing, from this particular insect. Another thing, your outlook environment is just looking for the damage. And the damage is gonna be sooty mold predominantly. Um, and the sooty mold is because they are very copious honeydew producers. Honeydew rains down onto everything below it. Sooty mold grows on it. And not only we see sooty mold on the leaves, you'll see it on the bark, you'll see it on the ground. And oftentimes you'll get so much honeydew, so much sugar on the ground, it starts to ferment and you get a vinegar smell associated with very hot populations. And we've come across that in Virginia as well. So uh, the nymphs finish, our, our, the adults start to emerge sometime in the middle of July. Uh, so they molt out at final skin. This is a tenoral adult. Um, and this is something you would commonly see and the middle to the end of July, the adults emerging. Then the adults are out and they're gregarious. Uh, they cluster on the hosts. Um, they're about an inch long with the wing spread. They're gonna be about an inch and a half wing, wingspan there. The picture on the uh, far right shows ones with the wings expand a little bit. That's actually a morbid, morbid, morbund adult. It was a tree that was treated with dinotefuran actually just a few hours before and the, and the, and the spotted lanternflies were hanging on there near dead. So um, they have long siphoning mouth parts that are held underneath the body. So 
even though um, that it is a fairly conspicuous thing to see, but because they hide it under the body between the legs, you don't really see it typically when you're finding them out in the field. The abdomen ha has some yellow coloration, but a couple things about that. One is that yellow coloration is the interstitial areas between the segments. And those interstitial areas don't show until the spotted lanternfly female starts to develop eggs um, inside uh, her abdomen. And so that you don't initially, when the first adults emerge in July, none of them show that yellow coloration. But later on, you get to be late summer, you start to see that yellow coloration much more commonly. Uh, so it's something to kind of keep an eye out for, but just be aware you won't see it in the beginning and it'll be only on the females at the end of the summer. Uh, again, look for some of the damage. Uh, this is the tree picture there on the far right is a walnut tree damaged by spotted lanternfly. And that's the kind of damage we're seeing, not just on walnuts, but also on Tree of Heaven and other trees in, in Virginia. Um, not as commonly as, as the populations that indicate. So it tends to be only a few trees here and they'll show that kind of a damage. Um, it's often you see trees with very high population and no apparent damage present on them. But again, look for that yellowing. It almost looks like herbicide injury um, and that would also be associated with very high populations of spotted lanternfly. So again, this is a shot of that same uh, tree there that was damaged by spotted lanternfly. All right, we can say work for cooperative extension. I used every kind of slide transition there is. So uh, this is another thing to look for out in the field. Uh, this, we get the sooty mold. You saw that picture earlier there on the left. You see the sooty mold, the streaks on the trunk there in the middle picture are on the far right. You start to see some other things you typically would find in the field. One is you will find the adults on the bark um, in, in high numbers. You also see the sooty mold, and then you see often these yeast patches developing on the trunk. So because of the high amounts of, of sugar in, in their droppings, you get this yeast growing there on the trunk. And so that's something you typically see in late summer. And again, very high, high, high populations. You see the material underneath the tree, the sugar collected under the tree, and you get that vinegar type smell. Um, and might have to dig a little bit sometimes to get a smell, but often it's very apparent just as you walk up to the site. And this would be a site where you could smell the vinegar um, present just, just by walking up to it. Um, so, and this is a real typical kind of scenario, late summer in the infested zone, unfortunately. So uh, this is kind of the, the scenario we're looking at. Right now we're about 60 square miles in Virginia. Um, but we're kind of looking at this as kind of with the yikes, like what are we kind of getting into down the road. Uh, late summer, um, uh, you get, uh, well, you can find males and females anytime you have the adults uh, and the mating, it doesn't occur until late summer. You can identify them in the field. The female have a, has a, a red process on the end of the abdomen uh, and you can separate them at that time. Notice that the yellow bands are um, not really apparent on a female. Um, and so this is because she hasn't developed the eggs yet. So as the eggs develop and the abdomen distends, then you would start to see those yellow bands on there for sure. So we see the first egg mass typically um, in the middle of September. And so you think back at some earlier comments on when the adults are present. The first adults are present in the middle of, of July. So we have a two month period that they're feeding and dispersing, which is kind of yet another bad thing about this invasive pest. So that there's a two month period um, for them to move about and often get a good distance away, maybe even hitchhike a distance away to another site. So two months after first adults, we see the egg masses. And although they typically are gonna be on Tree of Heaven, they can be just about anything. This is a twig out off of a black locust. Um, and you might think back earlier, the earlier slide that I showed as far as the different kinds of hosts where the oetheca have been found. And you'll see them not just on trees and shrubs, but also on, on non-tree hosts um, like concrete jersey barriers, uh, metal drums, um, rusty metal, all kinds of things, uh, truck trailers, um, rail cars, and on and on, unfortunately. 
So often you get clusters of egg masses, and this picture was taken by Mark Sutphin, an extension agent in Frederick County, um, who is, is uh, uh, really kind of jumped in and, and does everything spotted lanternfly and dealing with the public and helping with research and, and kind of extension agent extraordinaire if anybody's ever worked with him. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, you can see a few things here in this picture that Mark took. One is the new egg masses are fairly shiny, um, and this doesn't last too long. They start to get a little bit duller after, uh, after aging for a few weeks, um, eventually kind of get a very light gray, dusty appearance. You can also see some old eggs um, from the previous year. Note again, those elongate oval types of, of egg masses there. And uh, I mean, sorry, elongate oval holes from where the, from the eggs, where the eggs hatch. Now, it, again, it's typical of what spotted lanternflies do as they emerge from the eggs. Um, and so this is on a cherry tree. Um, so this is one of the hosts we're finding that's non atlantis where they are laying their eggs. And they do lay them everywhere. So you saw one picture before, uh, top right. But the, one of the preferred sites you get when you're scouting for um, spotted lanternfly is to look on the undersides of branches. And when you're looking up and you got a lot of background light, they do tend to kind of wash out. So it's kind of hard to see, um, but eventually you will develop an eye for it. But don't be embarrassed. You walk underneath a tree and later on come back and someone points out, hey, Eric, you walked underneath an egg mass. And, and there, in fact, it is. So that does take a little bit of time to look for these egg masses. They're probably the toughest thing to find um, when you consider how conspicuous the adults and nymphs are. All right, um, so again, you see this picture here, so these are repeat, but just to kind of get an idea, this is just, a, just to illustrate again how hard it is to find these egg masses. Um, this picture there, the large picture to the right is on a maple tree. Um, it's actually ground zero, right, at the initial detection site. And everywhere else. Um, so fortunately, the truck trailer there in the bottom left was an abandoned truck trailer, but just kind of again to emphasize that they do like rusty metal, uh, they, so you can see them on all kinds of things. So um, that's this, and this is also, you know, one, one of the way, many ways they potentially become uh, very good hitchhikers. All right, this is um, available online. This is a life cycle chart, which are kind of constantly sort of tweaking and updating a little bit each year. Uh, and so this is kind of the life cycle as we know about in Virginia. And so again, uh, just it seems to be just a one generation uh, per year. Um, we see no indication of two generations um, at this time. So we have a lot of resources available. Um, you look Spotted Lanternfly Virginia, um, you come across the web page, and we, we're constantly updating, adding to it, um, and, the, and the like. We just put some tutorials on there and some other kind of, kinds of information. So uh, feel free to take a look on there, use, borrow, whatever you want to do as far as little information. Be happy to help out any way I can as far as images and, and the like too. So I do want to mention too, and I'll, I'll probably let Rachel kind of chime in here at the end a little bit about the report a pest, report a pest um, a section with the first detector program. And so this is another way, if you suspect you have a an invasive pest or expect you have lots of lanternfly, they can be reported um, uh, in this manner. Um, and the report will come to the appropriate folks, um, both the cooperative extension as well as the Department of Agriculture. Um, so, which is Virginia Tech's working uh, hand in hand with the Virginia Department of Agriculture um, or VDAX as it's known. And so they are, uh, so it's something that's it's very important when you're dealing with invasives. And the the search for species, uh, the, the county and, and location, and these are then verified um, again and reported as I, I mentioned before. So this is, um, the, if you go back and think about that damaged walnut tree, uh, this was what every twig looked like on that walnut tree. So again, just kind of emphasize that you can build up to very excessive numbers with this particular insect. So it's kind of a brief rundown on, on, on this insect. Um, we've developed some other things, some online training for, um, for permits. So since it's a quarantine pest, uh, shippers um, 
of commodities, um, plant material, and any kind of truck conveyance that's coming in out of a quarantine zone uh, needs to have a spot land flight permit. So we've been working on farm agriculture in Virginia and developed a, a training program for that. A lot of online, re online resources as well too. So I think that kind of wraps up with what I've got here and I will see if I can go ahead and pause this video here or PowerPoint and I think I'll do a stop share. I guess does that work a little bit better? I can come back to it. Okay. Um, well, Eric, um, if you could look at your slides, we did have one question come in from Gail. I, I tried to answer it myself, but um, she asked about the U.S. map. So I don't know if in your slides, if the only U.S. map that you showed was the one that was the risk map. Um, I don't know if you want to bring that, if you're able to easily bring that one up. Um, but she was asking what this, I'm assuming she's on the West Coast. She was curious about the darker spots near Seattle. So can you just... Um, and I couldn't remember if the actual map that had the locations, I don't believe that map was a US map. So I think the only US map you had was the risk map. Yeah, I was saying, can you see it now, Rachel, the map? Yes. So this is a map developed by um, uh, Cornell um, IPM. And so this, I, I guess you could really consider this the national map as we know it. Uh, so this is the known locations are in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia. Uh, so the outside that area, it would all be blank. I know that outside that area, there have been regulatory incidents which shown up on cargo. And so when a dead adult is found on cargo in other states, that would not be listed as an infestation. And so the other map is produced by the a ARS, USDA AR ARS, um, and this is a projection map. Um, so based on the phenology, the known phenology of spotted lanternfly, and it's, and it's also potential host, these are what the models predict, the locations it's gonna be showing up in the highest numbers. So uh, I hope that it never does. Um, fit into that distribution, um, but that is what's looked at as potential distribution for this spot of life if it continues to spread and continues to, to, to essentially do well. But right now, really the only thing you need to kind of think about is this particular map here. Um, and it's really a little bit hard to see, but if you go to the map there, um, Cornell IPM, you'll see some red dots and the red dots are regulatory incidents. So those again are places where it's shown up on cargo, um, and this is, is, is not uncommon. We've had several in Virginia where they come in on a commodity, either that have, has come um, from uh, in another infested state, shall I say, uh, into Virginia, or ones that have moved from infestation, infested sites in Virginia to other, other sites. So the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, or VDAC, is constantly doing trace forwards um, and checking out some of these sites. And in fact, the site in Winchester was first detected in Virginia, was a trace forward site from the original stone yard infestation in central Pennsylvania. So hopefully that, does that answer the question, I hope? Um, it does, and as I look at the map again, um, I think that's just the way the map rendered the dark spots over in the far northwest corner of the U.S. has a lot of black, and I think that's just where all of those inlets and, and areas are. So that's, I wonder if that's maybe what, what that was. But definitely, yeah, the different colors um, are based on the areas at greater risk. Yeah, I think that far northwest is a map artifact. Um, as far as I know, um, it's, it's not been detected. I don't know if there's any detections made at the ports um, regulatory wise. Um, so, but uh, again, I, I know of no records in the, in the outside of that, um, the map that's shown uh, earlier. So Eric, I have a question, um, and I think there was another question that came in, um, but one question that I wanted to pose is, um, 
what happens when tree of heaven is not present or is there not really a case where there has been no enough of it's been removed from the landscape um are there other hosts that they are able to complete their life cycle on when when tree of heaven isn't available or as readily available yeah this is kind of gets into the learning curve category for for us and um let me get down to the list of, of hosts here we just i kind of i don't mean to sound like like eeyore but um we don't have i can't think of a site in virginia that doesn't have tree of heaven somewhere right nearby um it is it's just everywhere um and uh it again transportation corridors it prefers but you know i i live in a very rural part of in craig county virginia and they're up in, in deep in the forest um, on my property so tree of heaven seems to occur so we don't really have a site in Virginia that we can say we don't have a tree of heaven and what does spotted lamplight look like in that in that area. But if you see the this list here, I don't believe I can see this list of host, hosts. Um, the the ones with the, the Oetheca found um, we're still kind of in the learning curve as far as to figure out um, if they're able to complete their life cycle completely on those. Um, initially it was thought they had to have tree of heaven but we're starting to see some evidence again because these these egg masses being found other hosts that it, they may be able to be completing it without that. And there's some some dissertations are are being worked on right now. Um, we have Andy Duchesne in our department who's finishing up his master's degree and looking at phenology, and so it will kind of hopefully be answering some of these questions. But um, right now, I I don't think we can really say say for sure, um, but also, too, that um, you know, all these sites we're finding in Frederick County, there is tree of heaven somewhere nearby. Um, but, but again, they seem to be laying their eggs on non-tree of heaven hosts. Okay, thanks, Eric. Do you see a couple other questions have come in in the um, question and answer? I can read them. What plant parts do nymphs and adults feed on? Leaves, petioles, young stems, flowers, older stems, or bark? They primarily feed on stems. Uh, so the, the typical place to look for them would be on stems that uh, half to a quarter inch in diameter would be kind of the places you would typically find them if you were looking for them. Um, they may also be feeding on the mid ribs a little bit as well too. Kind of a little bit of a hint of that in that earlier picture I showed. They're lined up along the mid rib of that bittersweet, Japanese bittersweet, another invasive plant there too. So um, that would be the typical place that you would you would be finding and would be again those small stems and maybe along the center parts of some leaves. Low vegetation, um, primarily it's because we're looking, um, but the egg masses are found as high up in the tree as you can see with a pair of binoculars. So I suspect they're feeding high up in the tree, but the place we're sampling them is, is going to be down lower in the ground. Another question, um, how often is the Cornell um, spotted lanternfly map updated? It's a two-part question. Can anyone participate in the citizen science project, especially in Maryland? It's from Jody. Uh, uh, yes, if you want to participate in the uh, Citizen Science Detection Project, um, send me an email and um, I'm in the Virginia Tech directory and we, we can we can include you on that. We may have to do an okay with the Maryland Department of Agriculture to see about that. Again, you, again, you got a regulated pest. Um, what right, we're doing right now is that we're asking that people only survey for it on Tree of Heaven on property that they own. Um, so this kind of avoids the legal issues of surveying somewhere off, off site, off your property, where you may find a regulated pest that then would a, a quarantine might be imposed on that particular property. Uh, so I'd be glad to kind of share the formula we've used with the Citizen Science Detection Project with anybody as well too. So again, reach out to me about that um, and, and we'll see. Again, we're kind of sort of had to, to hold back this year quite a bit. We normally kick it off in March, um, uh, but due to COVID, we canceled that. But we are kind of having this very limited re, um, release or start on July 22nd in Front Royal, Virginia, 
where people are making appointments and coming by and get the equipment. We also have a lot of online training, which I can also forward to folks if they want to. I don't know how long often the Cornell map is updated. I know that that one I showed there and I um, was is in March. And the typically for us, the detections we get a range expansion don't occur until late summer. And that's predominantly because that's when the adults are flying and, and moving out. And that's when you start seeing them outside of the area. And they have also hitched a ride at that time. So I, I wouldn't, I, I don't necessarily think that the Cornell map is out of date because was, uh, March was the last update. It's just that that's not really at the time we typically pick up new detections or new expansions of its range. Okay, I just put um, Eric's email address in the chat for everybody to copy that down. So the information's out there, Eric, for people to be <laughs> contacting I'm, you. I'm happy to help. And, and what I'm doing, I, I, I'm just sort of trying to, to pay it forward. I, and Pennsylvania, and the folks in Pennsylvania have been extremely helpful and just wide open about helping me. So I just feel like I, I just need to do the same on Spotted Lanternfly. And uh, so, you know, if there's any way I can help you out, um, uh, please do reach out to me um, and I'll see what I can do for you on it. Great. Um, Eric, um, I, there is a question about damage on grapes. So if you covered this, I'm not sure, I don't recall, but can you talk a little bit about what is happening um, specifically with grapes? A little bit. Right now in Virginia, we have not had it detected um, on any economic crops. So we have seen on wild grape, we've seen on table grape in backyards um, and in very, very high numbers. I know that in Pennsylvania, um, reports from Heather Leach and Julie Urban and others have reported um, that there have been mortality in vineyards, mortality of vines due to heavy populations of spotted lanternfly in conjunction with some other stress factors um, too. We have not, again, we haven't seen um, this mortality factor yet in Virginia, but it's certainly something that has the wine industry's attention in Virginia and certainly something that a lot of, and some vineyards have also been involved with detection, um, this detection projects, I'm looking forward to kind of early indication. But I think the if you want some of the specifics on the, damage to grapes, I would reach out to the folks in Pennsylvania um, and, and get some information on that. But as of yet, we haven't seen it, but we do know that it does have the potential to kill vines. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Eric? Eric, I think yes, the other day when we practiced, and maybe you covered it today, um, you talked about the citizen science um, folks who are participating, um, or you know any of those people who are um, reporting, they're about 85% accurate in, in their you know, like initial field identification. Um, is it the same types of um, insects that are people are mistaking. I know you already said that it's a very distinct um, insect and not many other native things or introduced things look like it. Yes. So I guess, could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, the, um, we have actually, we've put together a few lookalike fact sheets. Uh, Teresa Dellinger here in the lab has developed a kind of a lookalike for the adults, the immatures, the egg masses. And so one of the big ones we get is box elder bug. Um, so, and so that's kind of a, it's, it's a good one to mistake it on because it does have a number of the characteristics that you look for, black and red, um, uh, clustering on the bark, that sort of thing too. So, uh, but there's really not much else. Um, and I'd say 85% is like an estimate, um, but it does, we do seem to have very high accuracy. We've asked that our detectors, um, that they, uh, report to us first um, if they have a suspect. We do have a portal um, on, on our Virginia uh, information. And so that's the portal is where people can send pictures on there too. So, um, you know, there's, so it's again, we kind of, uh, but as we do the training, 
Um, a lot of the same slides are kind of expansion on, on the presentation I had today as far as what to look for. We sent people home with uh, the detectors with fact sheets, wallet cards, um, all kinds of material out there. But fortunately, it's a very distinctive insect and there's really not much else like it. So anyway, it, it just seems to, it, it works very well as far as having people detect it. So there's another question posed in the chat. Are there methods to eradicate known areas of spotted lanternfly? Yes, uh, this insect responds very well to both systemic insecticides as well as contact insecticides. But a couple factors are one, uh, you have such high populations uh, that and it's a very mobile insect that when controls are, are done um, just in the very surrounding area or after the insecticide wears off, these things come back in. So uh, yes, it can be controlled pretty easily. I can't speak for uh, Pennsylvania growers, but the anecdotal report back from Pennsylvania is that growers are grumbly about it, but they can move in some control options and it can be, it can be controlled in most situations. But um, again, the mobility factor, it's kind of a lot like another invasive Japanese beetle where you, know, you, can, you can have a high mortality from a treatment, but yet due to its mobile nature, more of them are moving in. We are starting some control programs, um, some trials this, this year um, and this month actually, and so we'll have, kind of have some more information. Uh, again, some very excellent information available from Pennsylvania on that regard. All right. Um, I haven't seen a new question in a couple of minutes. So if anybody has any final questions for Eric, um, please do so now in the question and answer box. And I'll, while I give that a minute, I guess I'll just say thank you, Eric, so much. It's been um, very informative for me and I'm sure all of our viewers. Um, you know, for those of us who live in the Northeast, um, hopefully it's not coming to areas near us and definitely people in other parts of the US. Um, hopefully you don't ever get to experience this one firsthand. Um, I guess on the, on the positive side of this, it is easy to identify and people can help out, but it does spread um, very readily and quickly. So definitely something that you want to be able to find early. Um, Rachel, thank you for having me on. I it's uh, something I have, I talk about a lot. <laughs> it's been a, a big theme for us. Um, and in part because extension meeting, um, it's often producers there that call back and report new distributions of this insect. So, um, and as I've said a couple times here, I'd be happy to help out anybody, just reach out to me um, and I'll see what I can do for you. Great. So I'm just going to say, um, somebody asked about CEUs. There are no CEUs for this, unfortunately. Um, we, we are not doing that. And let's see, what else? So thanks again, Eric. Thanks for everybody for joining us today. We are recording this and it will be posted on the same uh, web page on the First Detector site that where you registered. And it will be, if not today, in the next couple of days. And if you're not already signed up, next week we're going to be learning about oak wilt um, with Brett Ahrens from the University of Minnesota. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you again, Eric, so much. And enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Thanks, Rachel. I thought that went great. I think so too.